Hello and welcome to this download from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is Ben Goldacre, scourge of homeopaths, nutritionists, and whole armies of those who practice what he calls bad science. I suggested to Ben that what he was interested in was less the individual practitioners of bad science, entertaining those whose exposure of them is, and more what they indicate about the general status of evidence-based science in our culture. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, you know, the, the people that I look at specifically, like the individual pharmaceutical companies or Patrick Holford, the vitamin pill salesman, or Gillian McKeith, the TV nutritionist, I'm not sure that any of those are individually massively important, although they're all pretty significant, big, sort of multi-million pound operations. But yeah, what's interesting about them is that they teach us about the whole process of how you can tell if a pill works or not, and also the process of how you can distort evidence, how you can misrepresent evidence, or how you can gather evidence in such a way that it is an unfair test of a treatment, which is something that, you know, alternative therapists and, uh, and big pharmaceutical companies uh, have in common. They have pretty much everything in common as far as I'm concerned, but, but um, you know, the, the, the tricks and the techniques that they use are basically identical. I was wondering, I mean, if you think as a species we're not especially well adapted to dealing with evidence, to dealing with causality in a, in a reasoned sort of way, if, we, if we're sort of in a way predisposed towards irrational beliefs, I, mean, I think there are studies which suggest that we, we believe the last thing we heard or we, we attribute causality and, and do, you th do you think that we're sort of, we're hardwired not to find it easy to deal with evidence-based science? Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And uh, in the chapter called, what's it called? Why Clever People Believe Stupid Things. Uh, I, I, I try and review, you know, a, a small section of the literature on, on irrationality. I mean, it's almost trivially true to say it because if it was really easy for us to tell that something quite rare is associated with something else quite rare or something quite common is associated with something quite common, if it was easy for us to deduce that by taking sort of cautious mathematical samples in our day-to-day -day lives, it would never have been an issue. It wouldn't have been necessary for us to come up with formalised systems for assessing causality. If we're presented with random data, we often think that we can see patterns in it quite erroneously. Um, and, and when we're as flawed on something as basic as, is there actually a pattern here at all, let alone what is the explanation for that pattern, then, then that seems to me to be very strong evidence, strong, a very strong argument for uh, the fact that we need to have you know, specific systems for measuring things and deciding if A causes B or prevents B or is completely unrelated to be. One of my favourite lines in the book is the plural of anecdote is not data, but that's a very prevalent attitude, isn't it? Again, I mean, it just comes down to that thing of, I don't mind if, if you've got some sort of childish, loopy ideas of your own, but if you're going to start talking about them, you have to be honest about what your evidence is, you know. And if your evidence is, I reckon, then I'm sort of vaguely disinterested. I, I think also one thing that's really important is that I, I have a very different... I think individuals and institutions have very different sets of responsibilities. Um, I mean, I, uh, I'm not surprised that somebody like Gillian McKeith exists who wants to manifest themselves to the world as a great expert and make a lot of money from selling pills and potions and, and sort of making bold assertions, which when you examine the, the evidence for them, it turns out to be really, really quite thin. I'm not surprised there are individual people like that in the world. And I almost don't expect, you know, the entirety of humanity universally to sort of be absolutely clear that they won't do things like that. I'm not even sure that behaving like that is necessarily terribly wrong. But I do think that Channel 4, as a broadcasting corporation who, you know, have to apply publicly to get hold of a limited amount of airspace and brand width that we allow them to broadcast to the nation, and it, you know, they shepherd ideas into our living rooms. I think they have a very different set of responsibilities. They have an obligation, to my mind, to be much more cautious about the the veracity of the things they bring to the public. So similarly, I'm not surprised that there are individual parents who are worried that MMR causes autism, and I'm not surprised that there are individual academics, or just one really, uh, Andrew Wakefield, who say, you know, I think MMR causes autism on the basis of very, very weak and arguably pretty flawed evidence. I don't think that people like Andrew Wakefield should be legislated against or silenced. I think that 
the entire British news media spectacularly misrepresenting the evidence on whether MMR causes autism and selectively, as I show in the book, only covering evidence which they've found, which they claim is evidence that MMR causes autism, but which actually, when you look at it, it doesn't, often doesn't even exist in the medical literature, and at the same time completely ignoring all the evidence that goes against their favoured hypothesis that MMR causes autism. I think, I think that's bad because I think, you know, that firstly, they are institutions which we all have higher expectations of than individuals. But also, it kind of offends my clear labelling policy. It feels to me like the transaction when I go into a news agent is that I give you 90p in exchange for proceed true facts in a portable format that I can take on the tube. And that's not an expectation I have of Andrew Wakefield, but it is an expectation I have of the Times or the Telegraph, uh, or to a lesser extent, the Mail. And presumably, if rich Westerners want to dose themselves with pills which are no better than sugar pills, you might say, so be it. But when it comes to offering homeopathy to AIDS patients in sub-Saharan Africa, clearly the stakes are higher. I don't really write very much about the sort of the concrete harms of alternative therapies or irrationalities, um, because I don't really, I'm not that kind of sort of histrionic consumer journalist kind of character. And to me, it's, uh, you know, for, for the most part, talking about quacks is really they're a kind of teaching tool for talking about the basics of evidence-based medicine. I mean, homeopathy really is the perfect tool for teaching how do we do a trial and what are the pitfalls because it's the perfect example of exactly what you're trying to avoid in evidence-based medicine. Homeopathy is a sugar pill which appears to perform better than a sugar pill because of cherry-picking the literature, people only quoting the positive studies and ignoring the negative ones because of people doing unfair tests where they're doing tests in a way that, that it's biased structurally, so that it's more likely to give a positive result for the homeopathic sugar pill rather than the placebo control sugar pill. And these are problems which happen in all forms of clinical trial and which happen to, a, you know, to an equal extent in, in the pharmaceutical industry's trials, except they can't get away with using quite such easy and obvious fudges that the homeopathy literature um, uh, betrays.